This episode of Christmas Past discusses Santa Claus, but maybe not in a way that younger listeners could appreciate. If there are little ones within earshot, save this for later. Thanks. Your name is Francis Farcellus Church, and you are the very picture of the no-nonsense newspaper man of the late 19th century, who sticks just to the facts. You even have one of those huge 19th century mustaches to complete the look. It's September 20th of 1897. You're sitting at your desk in the offices of the New York Sun, where you've been writing editorials for the last 20 years. When your boss, managing editor Edward Mitchell, walks into your office. Church, here's your next assignment. You do realize it's the middle of September, don't you, Mr. Mitchell? On my desk by three o'clock. This is for tomorrow's edition. And you're sure you want me to write this? Three o'clock, church, and make it good. (sighs) Now, what am I supposed to do with this? What are you supposed to do with this, indeed? Because surely Mitchell knew you well enough, knew that you were a second-generation journalist, that your father founded the New York Chronicle, that you were a New York Times correspondent during the Civil War, You've seen some things in your time, and at 58 years old, you'd gained a reputation as having a low tolerance for the frivolous and the sentimental. No sugarcoating for you. Some may even call you a curmudgeon and a cynic. Your editorials often addressed matters of religion, and they left little doubt about whether you were the kind of man inclined to ever accept anything on faith alone. You may shake your head and wonder why on earth Mitchell gave you, of all people, this assignment but you know better than to ruminate when there's a deadline to meet. So you look again at the piece of paper he handed you, and you read again the letter sent in by a reader from the Upper West Side of Manhattan, asking a fanciful question, the answer which would surely be a waste of ink and column space. But you're a professional, and in the course of writing the 400-odd words that would comprise the response, where you're speaking on behalf of the paper itself, something uncharacteristic happens. We'll never know exactly what or why or how. We only know for certain what remains for all of us to see today, that on September 21st of 1897, you wrote the words that would keep aglow what you describe as the eternal light with which childhood fills the world. Keep it aglow for that letter writer from the Upper West Side, as well as others like her for generations to come. When you replied plainly and simply, Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. I'm Brian Earle. This is Christmas Past. Our story technically begins in 1897, but it really starts nearly two decades earlier. Starting in 1880, daily newspapers in America entered a period of rapid growth. In just two decades, the number of dailies across the country more than doubled. And starting in the 1880s, an illustrator named Thomas Nast began drawing pictures of Santa Claus that would appear in Harper's Magazine and begin to shape our current image of Santa Claus. So print media were becoming more a part of everyday life. This was all new at the time, and it was starting to become an authoritative part of how we all celebrated and understood Christmas. So fast forward to the Upper West Side in 1897, where we meet a young Virginia O'Hanlon. A young girl, eight years old, asks her father if there's a Santa Claus. Some of her little friends are claiming to her that there is no Santa Claus. That's Carrie Christofferson. She's the curator at the Museum, a museum in Washington, D.C. Her father advises her that she should ask the newspaper. She should write to the sun because if you see it in the sun, it is so. And so she takes pencil to paper and writes a letter to the sun and asks this very question, is there a Santa Claus? At first, Church resisted writing any response at all. And even after he did write it, he didn't want to put his name on it. Nobody knew that he was the author until well after his death. Surely at the time, he didn't know he was writing what would go on to be the most reprinted newspaper editorial of all time. Dozens of papers reprinted every year, especially, you know, once it falls out of any kind of copyright infringement worries. And so you see it consistently even still. And I think that it's just heartening that this honest but heartwarming message still 
resonates for people today. But it's not just the honesty and the heartwarmingness of the response that accounts for its enduring popularity. This veteran journalist writes the response to Virginia's letter, and he takes a really deep look at answering this question. He could have given her a simple yes or no and sort of moved on with things just with that simplicity. But instead, he, he takes it to another level and sort of offers this explanation to her that has a little bit of magic about it. Perhaps unintentionally, Church had crafted a response that's kind of like one of those old optical illusions where you see a different picture depending on where and how you focus your gaze. If you are eight-year-old Virginia O'Hanlon, you're able to read his response and go, oh, he just said yes, there's a Santa Claus. But again, if you're, you've evolved a little bit more in your perception and thinking, you understand that he's giving you a much broader thought about what and who and how Santa Claus is in our lives. Even though our story started with eight-year-old Virginia O'Hanlon, this isn't really her story. But for the record, she went on to become a teacher, and throughout her life she'd answer letters and do interviews about that famous question she sent to the newspaper back in 1897. She lived till the age of 81 and passed away in 1971. And Frances Farcellus Church, who spent a career cutting through bluster and eschewing sentiment, would unwittingly create his only real legacy as a journalist when he reluctantly replied to a little girl on the brink of disillusionment when he wrote these words. Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with the boundless world around him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist, and you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would the world be if there were no Santa Claus? It would be just as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance, to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The eternal light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus? You may as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch in all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus, but even if they did not see Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus. But that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Of course not, but that is not proof that they're not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders there are unseen and unseeable in the world. You may tear apart the baby's rattle to see what makes the noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world which not the strongest man, nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived could tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love, romance can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernatural beauty and glory behind it. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world there is nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus. Thank God he lives and lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia. Nay, ten times ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. Now, one thing that's a bit of a mystery is why little Virginia was asking about Santa Claus in September. Even for a guy like me, that seems a little early for a child to start thinking about Christmas. The length of the Christmas season and when it's appropriate to decorate have always been up for debate. That's something Carrie in Arkansas knows about as she shares in this Christmas memory. These days, many people start decorating for Christmas long before the turkey is cleared from the Thanksgiving table. But at the time my parents celebrated their first Christmas together in 1971, most people did not decorate their Christmas tree until right before the actual holiday. 
my mom and daddy, for whatever reason, decided to put their tree up the first Sunday in December that year, and that tradition stuck. For the past 48 years, the first Sunday in December has been reserved as tree decorating day in my family. What began with just the two of them expanded to include me and my brother, our spouses, and eventually five grandchildren. The Christmas tree is not always the same. Some years there was an artificial tree with limbs that had to be assembled and branches fluffed. Other years there was a cedar cut from the nearby woods. The locations aren't always the same. There are memories from the mobile home where I had many magical Christmases as a child, to the log cabin in the woods in which they lived when their grandkids were young, to the home they live in now just a few miles from both my brother and me and our families. But one thing that remains the same is the joy we have planning, anticipating, and spending time together on Tree Decorating Day each year. You can read more of Carrie's thoughts on a whole host of topics over at her blog, themarvelousandthemundane.com. And you can share your Christmas memory with me. Just record a voice memo into your phone and send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. Christmas Past is produced in sunny San Mateo, California by yours truly, Brian Earle. Thank you so much to Carrie Christofferson and Carrie in Arkansas. And thanks also to the actors in our opening skit. That was Michael Colby playing the part of Francis Farcellus Church. He's from the podcast Jack Billings Presents, Me and My Neighbor Michael. Find them on Twitter at Jack Billings Pod. You also heard from Tony Barthel playing the part of Edward Mitchell. You can find out more about him at anthonybarthel.com. That's Anthony, B-A-R-T-H-E-L.com. And I'll have links to those as well as Carrie's blog and much, much more in the show notes for this episode at christmaspast.media. And you'll find me on social media. Look for Christmas Past on Twitter and Instagram and do make sure to join the Facebook group for year-round Christmas fun. And hey, if you're feeling the Christmas spirit, why not help more people discover this show? You can tell a friend about it or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you leave a review, I'll even send you a sticker to say thanks. Again, you can reach me at christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com for details. We'll meet again soon, and until then, may your days be merry and bright.